Well, good morning, New Day. Always so good to see you guys. Thanks for being with us in person. Thank you to those who have tuned in online. Uh, again, I'm just so glad you decided to join us as we continue our current teaching series, which if you're new is called Christ the King. And uh, in this series, what we're doing is we're simply studying the gospel according to Matthew. In the Bible, there's four different accounts of the life and teaching and death and resurrection of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in this series, we're studying Matthew's account of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, last week, our text was Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. And last week, our theme was the King's Herald. And last week, we learned that the King's Herald was none other than John the Baptist. And so last week, I introduced you to the King's Herald, John the Baptist. Well, this week... Our text is Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 through 12, and this week our theme is the king's requirement. And this week builds on last week. This week what we're looking at is the message that John the Baptist came to herald to all the nation of Israel. He came to share the king's requirement, and so that's what we're looking at today. By way of introduction, I want to share with you this. My wife and I go to Costco a lot. All right, we go to Costco a lot. All right, stop and shop too, but Costco's probably our favorite and we are there all the time. Now, I'm a little embarrassed to say this out loud, but the reality is we will be on like a date night and we'll like finish dinner and be like, what do you want to do now? And be like, want to go to Costco? And the answer is always yes, okay? I know you young bucks out there, all right, you're like, okay, that's not a hot date. But when you got five kids, Costco's a hot date, all right? So, you know, we love going to Costco. The answer is always yes. It's just absolutely great. And I love Costco for many reasons, but one of them is this. You go in there, and every time I'm in there, I find 25 things that I can't live without that I didn't even know existed before I walked in, okay? I I just love it. It's great, you know? America, okay? So anyway... But Costco is interesting to me because uh, they don't just let you waltz on into the store. They require you to have a membership. You got to pay money in order to go buy products that gives the company money. What a great business model, you know? But they require you to have a membership in order to walk in the store. So if you were to just try to this afternoon after church, you know, get some shopping done and you were trying to just waltz on in, you're not going to be able to get through the door because they literally hire someone whose sole purpose seems to be to just check and make sure that you meet the store's requirement for shopping there. They're going to say membership card, membership card, membership card. I would not want that job, okay? Just asking the same thing over and over. But it's the requirement of the store. Well, I want to use Costco as a metaphor for just a moment for the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is like Costco in that you can't just walk on in. You can't just waltz on in. The kingdom of heaven has requirements for entrance, just like Costco. To get in Costco, you have to meet the requirement of membership, but to enter the kingdom of heaven for all eternity, the kingdom that Christ will one day rule over forever, to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to meet the requirement of repentance. And that's what we're talking about today. The king's requirement is repentance. Now, last week I introduced you to repentance and I even defined it. I said, here's a real user-friendly, it's not a technical definition, but here's a real user-friendly definition for repentance. It's turning from a life that is predominantly characterized by sin and turning to a new life that is predominantly characterized by righteousness, which simply means right living as defined by God's word. So last week, I just kind of introduced you to the concept, gave you a user-friendly working definition of what repentance is, Uh, but this week, we're going to dive much deeper into this topic of repentance because, again, repentance is the king's requirement. It's what's required for you and I to enter into and become citizens of the kingdom of heaven that Christ will rule over forever. Okay, all that by way of introduction, let me now read to you the passage we're studying today. Again, it's Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 to 12. Matthew writes, but when he, John the Baptist, 
saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to even carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Again, friends, what we see here in a nutshell is the king's requirement, which is repentance. And now we're going to go a little deeper into the text. So if you're taking notes today, grab your pen. Here's the first fill in the blank. I'm just going to walk you right through the passage. The first thing that we see in our text is this. We're going to call it the congregation. And here we're looking at the group of people that John the Baptist addressed when they flocked out to him in the Judean wilderness by the Jordan River. And we see this group in the first part of verse 7 where Matthew writes this, But when he, John the Baptist, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism. So friends, these two groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they made up the religious leaders of the nation of Israel. And it's like this. You say, why were there two groups? Well, it's the same reason there's a number of different groups of uh, Christianity today. So let's just pretend uh, over here in this section, you guys uh, are the Baptists. Let's pretend you here in the middle, you're the Pentecostals. And then you over here, you're the, uh, I don't know, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Methodists, you know, take your pick, okay? Um, and then there's so many different subdivisions of each of these main divisions. And well, here's what the deal is. Um, in the same way that Christianity is divided into different groups today based on differences of belief, differences of interpretation of scripture, so it was with Judaism. Judaism was also divided into different groups, two main ones, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, based on beliefs. The one group believed in angels and the resurrection from the dead, the other one didn't, and you know, so it is today. Some groups say, I believe in the gifts of the Spirit, they've continued on, they're for us who live today. Uh, other groups of Christianity say, no, the gifts of the Spirit, that was for the apostle, and that's you know, faded away you know, from existence and all this kind of stuff. So Judaism was divided. Between 200 and 100 BC, these two primary uh, groups, the Pharisees and Sadducees, emerged within the nation of Israel. Now, however they may have originally started, by the time of John the Baptist, in the time of Jesus, they had become thoroughly corrupt. So maybe they began uh, well-intentioned, maybe it was all good to start, but by the time of John the Baptist and Jesus, uh, these two groups had become thoroughly corrupt. And that's why Jesus just condemns them in Matthew chapter 16, verse 6. He said this to his disciples, he says, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So it's like this, I will sometimes make a delicious margarita pizza uh, from scratch at my house, and when I take that dough, I got to work a little leaven into it, and I just start, you know, going through and just working the dough and working the dough, and what happens is the leaven quickly spreads throughout the whole batch of dough. And so what Jesus then is saying uh, about these two religious leaders, these two groups of religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, is this. He's telling his followers, watch out for their corrupting influence, which is spreading throughout the land of Israel. And friends, the reason that Jesus had such a problem with these two groups of religious leaders is simple. They were supposed to be here on earth as God's representative, illuminating for the people the way by which they might be saved, and instead they were teaching the people wrong. They were teaching people the wrong way to be saved. Number one, they taught the people you're saved simply because you're Jewish. Now, the Jews are those who descend from Abraham. But friends, nowhere in the Bible does it say, you will be saved if you simply physically descend from Abraham, if you're a Jew. 
The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says you'll be saved if you have the same faith that Abraham had. Abraham had faith in the Messiah that God promised to send into the world. And if we, like Abraham, have that same faith in that same Messiah, we will be saved. But nowhere does it say in Scripture, if you simply physically descend from Abraham, you will be saved. So they were teaching the people wrong. But they didn't just teach that. Number two, they also taught you're saved simply because you have God's law. But this was wrong too because having God's law counts for nothing. It's obeying God's law that counts for something. So they were wrong on this front as well. And then thirdly, they taught the people, you're saved because you're circumcised. Now, circumcision was just a religious ceremony. Never saved anybody in the Old Testament, uh, never saved anyone in the New Testament, never will save anyone in the future. A religious ceremony has never and will never have the power to save. But they were just telling the people, the religious leaders were telling the people, just make sure that you've gone through the religious ceremony and you'll be all set. I mean, you know, you're, you're Jewish, so, you know, you're automatically in, you have God's law, you're automatically in. Just make sure you go through the religious ceremony. And I mean, it's, it's just a guaranteed thing. You are going to heaven. But this was wrong. We are saved by faith. And the evidence of genuine saving faith is Repentance but the religious leaders were teaching the people wrong. And this is why Jesus um, said this to the religious leaders of Israel in Matthew chapter 23, verse 13. Jesus said, you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You're supposed to be doing the opposite. You're supposed to be opening the door to the kingdom of heaven. But by your faulty, heretical teaching, you are shutting the door of the kingdom of heaven right in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. So by teaching the people wrong, they were not teaching salvation comes by faith and the genuine evidence of saving faith is repentance. Instead of teaching that, they were just making up their own requirements of what they thought would get someone into the kingdom of heaven. And in so doing, they were shutting the door of the kingdom, the very door they were supposed to be opening to the people. Now, there's a ton more that could be said about the congregation, the group of people that John the Baptist addressed, but you have what you need uh, for us to now continue on in the passage. Now that you've seen the congregation, let's look next at the confrontation. And it makes sense, right, why John needed to confront these religious leaders. I mean, John was a prophet sent from God. And so he was God's uh, mouthpiece, and God, of course, didn't want the people being taught wrong, and so John was sent to confront them for their heretical teaching. And we see the confrontation uh, in verses 7 to 9, where John says this, and I want you to notice how offensive he is, how not seeker-sensitive John is. Okay, nowadays, oh, seeker-sensitive, let's just, you know, let's not offend anyone so that everyone can enter the kingdom. We don't see that in the Old Testament prophets. We don't see that in John. We don't see that in Jesus. We don't see that in Paul. Sometimes when it comes to a serious matter like heaven or hell, you have to be direct. And being direct is actually the most loving thing you can do. If someone's house is burning and you scream at them, get out, you're going to burn, that's a loving thing to do. If you say, oh, I wouldn't want to raise my voice or say anything offensive, so let me just not say anything. That's the most unloving thing you can do. John was sent by God. John loved the people, even these heretical religious leaders. And so he boldly confronts them saying this, you brood of vipers who warns you to flee from the wrath to come. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham if he wanted. Now there's a lot here, but let's begin with the first thing he says, you brood of vipers. Now, the viper is a poisonous snake. There's eight different species in the land of Israel, but they're all basically like this desert-horned viper in that they're capable of killing you. 
So get the picture in your mind. There's tens of thousands of people that have come out to the Judean wilderness to John by the Jordan River for his ministry. And the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, see all the people going and they're like, hey, we're kind of supposed to be the leaders of the religious movement in this nation. So of course, we're going to go out with the people. And so they show up. And when they show up publicly, John confronts them. And he says to them, although he's really speaking to the people around them, he identifies them for what they are, a brood of vipers. In other words, he's saying to the nation of Israel, these people parade around as your leaders and they kind of act like they are someone that you should follow, but let me correctly classify them in your mind. They are not leaders that should be followed. They are poisonous snakes that you should stay away from at all costs. In the same way that a poisonous snake can kill you physically, so the poisonous teaching of the Pharisees, the heretical poisonous teaching of the Pharisees, how they taught the wrong way to be saved, he's saying that can kill you spiritually, so stay away from them. Now John directs a poignant question at the religious leaders, and he says this, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And here John is continuing the viper imagery. So a farmer would go ahead and burn the stalks in his field after a harvest, and when that fire would happen, uh, the vipers, along with other little critters, would go ahead and flee as to escape the burning flames. And so what John is saying to the religious leaders is, you're here for the wrong reasons. You're not here to escape the flames of hell by meeting the king's requirement, which is repentance. You're just out here because you mistakenly think that going through the religious ceremony of baptism will save you in the same way that you mistakenly think that going through the religious ceremony of circumcision will save you. But you are wrong on both fronts. So who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You're here for the wrong reasons. John's saying. So John goes ahead and tells them what will save them. He's speaking to them in very harsh language, but it's coming from a place of love. So after kind of rebuking them, now he shares with them how they can be saved. And he says this, this is what God demands. This is God's requirement. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, I don't want anyone to get confused because in our teaching series on Romans, we said that we are saved by faith. And now we see John pointing out that you can only enter, be saved and enter into God's eternal kingdom if you bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And so if we're not careful, we might think that the Apostle Paul in Romans is saying one thing and that John the Baptist here is saying another. But friends, that's not the case. The Bible teaches throughout the entire Bible, beginning to end, we are saved by faith. And when you're genuinely, truly saved, if you have saving faith, there will always be the evidence of a changed life, uh, which comes from repenting. So Paul and John taught the same thing. But what John the Baptist is focusing on here is the evidence of genuine saving faith. It's fruit. That's in keeping with repentance. So John's saying to the religious leaders, you say you're saved, but your lifestyle doesn't back up your profession of faith. So sorry, but on the authority of the word of God, you are not the true spiritual sons of Abraham. You are not recipients of eternal life. You are not citizens uh, of the kingdom. You're not sons of God, you're sons of the devil. This is also implied by calling them a brood of vipers. He's saying you're children of, of snake. Okay, the original snake, of course, was Satan. So he's saying you're not sons of God, you're sons of the devil, you're not citizens of the kingdom of heaven. You think you already have entrance in, but you don't because you don't meet the king's requirement, which is repentance, the proof of genuine saving faith. You see, instead of meeting God's requirement of repentance for salvation, the religious leaders were trusting in their ancestry. They were saying, you know, we're descendants of Abraham. We're good. What do you mean we have a problem? We descend from Abraham. We are Abraham's offspring. And that's why John says what he says in verse 9. He told them, don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. 
For I tell you, God's able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham if he wanted to. So back to what I was saying before. If you have Abraham's same faith, you will be saved. But merely physically descending from him counts for absolutely nothing in terms of your salvation. But the requisite changed life was the very thing the religious leaders did not have. And because they were not only teaching the people wrong, but were modeling everything wrong to the people, John was sent by God to confront them. And so we see the confrontation. And now that you've seen the confrontation, let's note the next thing we see in our text, which we're going to call the condemnation. And here, John gives the two groups of religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, a little glimpse into what they can expect in the future. And John lets them know that because they refuse to meet the king's requirement of repentance for entrance into the kingdom, they cannot expect a warm welcome one day into that kingdom that God's appointed Messiah to rule over forever. John's letting them know that what they can expect is eternal condemnation. And that's why I've labeled this point the condemnation. Because that's what they could expect moving forward because of their refusal to meet God's requirement. And this is what John's getting at in verse 10. When he says this, Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, John is speaking to an agrarian society, people who made their living from what was in their field and from their flocks. And so he's using an illustration they can all relate to. At the end of a farming season, the farmer would go into his orchard and he would go ahead and make note of which trees didn't bear fruit because he wanted to go ahead and cut them down so that he could plant other, uh, you know, trees in their place that would bear fruit. He didn't want those uh, non-bearing trees to remain in the orchard, taking up valuable resources, minerals, and, you know, all these things in the soil. He wanted to get rid of them. So he would go ahead and lay his axe at the base of a tree he intended to cut down. So when you walked by uh, an orchard at the end of the, the harvest of that fruit season, whatever it was, and you saw an axe at the base of the tree... You're like, that tree's getting cut down. It didn't produce fruit. That tree is becoming uh, firewood for the farmer and for his family. And so this was an image that all the Israelites John was preaching to out in the Judean wilderness by the Jordan River could relate to. And so what he was saying is, this is a word picture of how it's going to work if you refuse to repent. If you refuse to repent, you will only serve as fuel in the future for the fires of hell. And John just told them plainly, the ax is laid to the root and you're not bearing fruit. So what you can expect is to be thrown into the fires of hell. This is the condemnation. Okay, pretty intense sermon, right? Thank God for point number four. Now that we've seen the condemnation, let's look at the consolation the consolation. Now, the word consolation simply means comfort, and that is precisely what is needed after John's hellfire brimstone confrontation, where he told them about the condemnation that they could expect in the future. So having told the religious leaders they're not saved, having told them they don't meet God's requirement of repentance, and having told them that at present all they can expect in the future is eternal condemnation, John now switches gears and he, comf- he gives them comforting words of hope, explaining to them clearly how they can escape such a terrible fate. And this is what we see in verses 11 to 12, where John tells them about Messiah The great king who God promised to send into the world who would save the world from the penalty that God's law demands for sin. John told him this. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. 
Now, I'm not sure if you noticed it or not, but what I want you to know is that John here mentions three different baptisms. He mentions the baptism of repentance, the baptism with the Holy Spirit, and then the baptism of fire. Let me just kind of walk you through each of these real quick. Number one is the baptism of repentance. And friends, that's what's coming up in just two weeks here at New Day. Two Sundays from now, I believe on Sunday, February 20th, we are going to have water baptisms in all three services. We'll at least give the opportunity for people to be baptized in all three services. And this is a baptism of repentance. In other words, people will be doing the very thing God commands them to do once they repent. God says, once you repent, you need to go ahead and act out physically what took place spiritually on the inside when you repented. And so people go into the waters of baptism, the water uh, representing a grave, and they go down under the water. And that's symbolic of them burying their old life, which was predominantly characterized by sin. And then when they rise back up, out of the water, that's to represent that they're rising up into a new life. They're resurrecting up, just like Jesus did, but into a new life, one that is predominantly now characterized by righteousness or right living uh, according to the Word of God. So this is the first baptism mentioned, the baptism of repentance. But John mentions a second baptism. And the second one is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Now, there's so much confusion about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Let me make it very simple for you. The baptism with the Holy Spirit is just another way to refer to salvation. The very moment that you get saved, the Holy Spirit of God indwells you. The moment you repent and turn to God in faith, the moment you do that, Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to indwell you from that moment forward, and that is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus who does the baptizing, and you are baptized into the body of Christ. You become a part of of the church, the body of Christ. Now, this is the plain teaching of Jesus, so I don't know why there's so much confusion uh, over this topic, but take a look at John chapter 14, verses 15 to 17, where Jesus said this, "'If you love me, obey my commands.'" And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him, and it doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. So at this point, Jesus was speaking to his followers. Jesus had not yet uh, resurrected from the dead and ascended back to heaven. But the moment he did, in keeping with his promise, on the day of Pentecost that we read about in Acts chapter 2, Jesus made good on his promise, and he sent the Holy Spirit. And from that day forward, every single person who has genuinely repented and placed their faith and trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit was no longer with them, the Holy Spirit is now in them. And if you've repented, he's in you. And I've repented, so he's in me. He's not just with us, he is in us. And that is what is biblically the baptism with the Holy Spirit. It is another way of saying salvation. For those who repent, they experience a baptism of salvation. But now moving on to the third and final baptism John's mentions, which is this. It's the baptism of fire. The baptism with the Holy Spirit is for those who repent. Obviously, the baptism with fire is for those who do not. Now, friends, fire is a clear reference to judgment. Look at the verses before. Fire means judgment. Look at the verses after. It means judgment. Look at all the verses in the Old Testament about fire. It's judgment. So the baptism of fire is a clear reference to judgment. Now, what you need to understand is this. The Old Testament, all right, there's 39 different books that collectively make up the Old Testament. The very last one, the 39th book of the Old Testament, is the book of Malachi. And Malachi is only four chapters long. Well, in the fourth chapter, the last chapter of the last book of the Old Testament, here's how it ends. Take a look. Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. Malachi, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaks of the coming day that will be burning like a furnace and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. Everyone say chaff. 
Every evildoer will be chaff, and the day that is coming will set them ablaze. Now, after this prophecy of Malachi, the prophetic voice in Israel goes silent for some 400 years. But guess what? When it finally picks back up, it picks back up with John the Baptist referencing this verse of judgment that comes in the form of fire. Take a look. Matthew chapter 3, verse 12. John says of Jesus, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So here's John the Baptist referencing Malachi chapter 4, verse 1, and applying it to the ministry of Jesus. And once again, we are given a word picture here, another farming word picture for those who were living in a farming society. So here's the deal. Most of us, last service, we totally had a farmer in here, and I was like, he knows exactly what I'm talking about. This is awesome, you know? But for the rest of us who don't farm, all right, here we go. At the end of the harvest, the wheat harvest, when the wheat was ripe, the farmers would go ahead and they would cut the stalks of wheat. So at the bottom, you see stalks of wheat. And they would let them dry out a bit in the sun, and then they would go ahead and separate the kernels of wheat. That's what you see on the top, the kernels of wheat. They would separate them from the chaff. Uh, anybody in here like Italian food and make it from scratch? Well, you got to take the garlic and you got to separate it uh, from its casing. Well, the casing, that real light stuff, that's the chaff. And then you've got the garlic. Well, in the same way, the kernel of wheat is inside its casing. When you separate it and take it out, the casing is worthless, it's light, that's the chaff. And what remains is the kernel of wheat that you can use to make bread. But you have to go ahead and separate it. And so here's how they would do that. You would just take a big old board, you tie it to the back of your donkey, and that big heavy board would uh, just be dragged over the top of the wheat. And when they would drag it over the top of the wheat, it would just kind of crush it down and it would remove the casing from the wheat. And so what you'd have on the floor in front of you was this huge pile of chaff and wheat, the kernels of wheat and the chaff. So what you would have to do at this point is you'd have to separate the chaff from the wheat, and you would do this with a winnowing fork. Now, we don't really do this. If you're driving down the road today on the way home from church, you probably won't see anyone winnowing their wheat, um, but this happens all over the world, um, even to this day. So take a look. Here's a picture of a man winnowing his wheat. You take your winnowing fork, and you put it in the big pile of mess that's on the ground, um, and you just throw it up in the air. And the Israelites would do this during the time of day where they could count on a wind coming from the Mediterranean Sea. So they knew exactly when to go out each day to winnow their wheat. And so they'd throw it up in the air, and that light casing, the chaff, it would blow away in the wind while the heavier kernel of wheat would just fall right back down to the ground. Now you'd take the kernels of wheat and you'd put them in your barn, and with that huge pile of chaff, I mean, imagine you had 100 acres of land and you did all your wheat. You're going to have a mountain of chaff on your property. So what do you do with the chaff? You burn it you burn it. So do you see, friends, John is giving the people an illustration or a word picture that they can totally understand. And he's saying, Jesus, in the coming judgment, will separate the wheat from the chaff. Now, the wheat represents those who have repented. The chaff represents those who refused. And what he's saying is the wheat will be gathered into the barn, the barn being a picture uh, for heaven. But the chaff will be burned. And this, of course, is a picture of hell. So John's giving them, and us by extension, a word picture of what it's going to look like in the future. And if I could be so bold as to summarize John's teaching on these three different kinds of baptism, uh, I would do it as follows. Take a look. Here's what John is saying in a nutshell. John's saying the glorious news of the gospel is this. You can avoid the baptism of fire and instead receive the glorious baptism of the Holy Spirit if you meet God's requirement of the baptism of repentance. And so do you see why we're calling this point the consolation? Because here John gives the comforting words of hope that they don't have to experience the eternal fires of flame. They can be the wheat that's gathered into the barn, 
which is a word picture for heaven. But John lets them know, and us, that the way to do this is through repentance. We are saved by faith, but the proof or the evidence of genuine saving faith is the changed life that comes from repentance. Now, John needed to start with hell to get right to the gravity of the situation, but he ends with comforting words of hope, instructions on how to escape such judgment. And the instructions couldn't be simpler. They are repent. Friends, what we've been learning in this series, I hope you've been seeing it, is that Matthew wrote to reveal that Jesus is the king that God promised to send into the world, who would save the world from sin and one day rule over an eternal kingdom. And Matthew presents Jesus as that king. And so far in this series, we've learned about the king's ancestry, and we've learned about the king's birth, and we've learned about the king's birthplace, and we've learned about the king's herald. Well, this week we've learned about the king's requirement, which is repentance. And and by way of application today, I I just want to ask you this. Have you repented? Does your life manifest the evidence of genuine saving faith. The application for those who lived back then was to repent. So the application for us who live today, it's the exact same. Repentance, that is the application of today's sermon. And my question is, have you repented of your sins? You say, oh no, Mike, absolutely. I said a prayer once and I was like, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. And hey friends, don't confuse the confession of sin with the repentance from sin. Two totally different things. You can say all you want, Jesus, forgive me of my sin, and then you can just keep living the same sinful lifestyle. Salvation does not come to anyone who does that. It's not confessing sin that saves. It's repentance of sin that saves. I like to view it like this. The other morning, I brought my two oldest kids, Allie and Lincoln, to Chick-fil-A. Hallelujah. Christian chicken, hallelujah. (laughs) My son forgot to eat breakfast. I said, I got you covered, man, let's go. And so we went to Chick-fil-A and we got this little chicken biscuit. It's like the meal number two, but don't try to go today because they're closed on Sunday. But it was delicious. I got one for Allie, one for Lincoln, and of course I got one for me. I was thinking about getting five for me. They're amazing. But after I paid for my food, here's what happened. The lady gave me a receipt. Now, you think I was worried as I drove off that the police would pull me over and be like, you stole this food. No way. I had my receipt. I had the proof that I had purchased that food. What I want to show you today is this. The receipt of genuine saving faith is repentance. The proof that you're in possession of genuine saving faith is the changed life that you will have that comes from repentance. You have it, you're good. You will be granted entrance into the eternal kingdom of Christ. You don't have it, you will not. Those who repent will be gathered into the barn, into heaven. Those who don't will be burned as chaff. Hell will be their eternal destiny. This is the clear teaching of the word of God. And I gotta say this, I'm actually so proud of the people in our church. Just a few weeks ago, we saw a video testimony of someone from Celebrate Recovery, and I'm just so proud of her. In her video, she talked about repentance. She understood that she had to leave one life behind and then adopt a new one. And I was just like, praise the Lord, that is someone who is a citizen of heaven. A couple years back, someone came to our church. It was a couple. They had several kids. They were living together in sin. They were living together. They weren't married and this and that and the other. And they came to our church and that was what was going on. And and they just came and they began to sit under biblical teaching. And what they learned by being here at New Day where we preach the true gospel is that God requires a change in your life to be saved. You can't just say, oh, God, forgive me. I'm sorry. And then just keep, you know, living together in sin. 
No, no, no. There's got to be a, a lifestyle that backs up your profession of faith for God to count your profession as genuine saving faith. And they learned that here. And guess what they did? They got married. And they did it 100% because they just knew this is what God requires. I, I don't want to just say I'm a Christian. I want to be a, a true Christian. I love what someone else did just a little bit back. It was Thanksgiving, and I was talking to someone who uh, began attending our church just a couple years ago. And I said, oh, what are your plans for Thanksgiving? And he said, I don't have any. And I was so sad by that, but I was like, why? And what he said made me so happy on the inside. He said, well, I kind of came out of a sinful lifestyle, and I've repented of my sins, and I'm now following Jesus, and I know that these friends would absolutely serve uh, no positive influence on my life. Every time I'm with them, I just get sucked back into a lifestyle that I've turned away from. And so I'll be spending Thanksgiving on my own this year, but I'd rather do that than dishonor the Lord. And I was like, this is someone who shows the receipt of genuine saving faith. Friends, I could go on forever because I've just seen it in one person after another, after another, after another, after another at our church. Now, I wish I could say I've seen it in everyone. No, I haven't seen it in everyone. But I've seen it in so many. And I want to encourage you to be those who truly repent. Friends, when you truly repent, it affects your friendships, it affects your marriage, it affects your finances, it, it affects your entertainment choices, it even affects where you go on vacation. You say, what do you mean? Hey, maybe pre-Christ, you're just living it up. Hey, sin city, here I come. And you're just, you know, let me party and live it up. Well, hey, once you get, that's to be expected if you're not saved. But once you get saved, there needs to be a change. That's now out of bounds with the word of God. Partying in sin city, that's out of bounds with the word of God. Now there's a new life and there's new choices and there's new things if you're truly following Jesus. So New Day, what I want us to do in closing is just this. It's real simple. Would you just close your eyes wherever you are, whether you're online, here in person, just close your eyes. And I just want to ask, would you do some soul searching today? Just ask yourself real quick, am I like the Pharisees and the Sadducees who don't, who don't bear any fruit in keeping with repentance? H have I said I'm saved? H have I said I, I now follow God, but I'm just living the exact same way as I did before? Am I like the Pharisees and Sadducees? that the Lord rebuked and that John confronted with a message of condemnation? Am I like them? Or am I ever being changed into the image and likeness of Christ? Now, friends, don't, don't ask yourself, am I perfect? That's not what we're talking about. Romans 7 teaches us we'll never be perfect on this side of eternity. So do not judge by the standard, am I perfect? Judge by this standard instead. Ask yourself, is my life predominantly and overwhelmingly characterized by right living as defined by the word of God. Because when you've repented, it will be. You won't be perfect, but you will overwhelmingly be living in accordance with the word of God. Ask yourself this, am I living as God says I should, as laid out in his word, or am I out of bounds by the standard of the word of God? Friend, ask yourself, where am I at today? And friend, if you know that you're not where you need to be, if you're not where God requires you to be to enter the eternal kingdom of Christ, would you just take a second right now to get right with God? Maybe you'd say this in your heart, God, I've been playing games. I've been professing one thing, but my life hasn't backed up my profession. So God, let me just acknowledge before you what you already know. I have not truly repented. But God, I want to make that right today. I want to make it right, right now. Because now I understand what you expect, and it's a changed life that comes from repentance. God, I'm saved by faith, but the proof of genuine saving faith is the changed life that comes from true repentance. God, thank you for making it so clear what you require for me to live forever in the kingdom of heaven. God, I thank you that you've made it clear so that I can get in line with what you require. God, I give you praise. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for experiencing this message with us. 
If you've been blessed by what you heard, you can give a one-time or reoccurring gift at newdaychurch.cc forward slash giving or text any amount on your smartphone right now to 84321. We would love to connect with you even more, so be sure to like us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram. And don't forget to find us on the Church Center app for more information about all things New Day. May God bless you, and we hope to see you again soon.